Good morning, everybody. Thank you for finding your way here. Uh, in case there's any doubt, this is the session New Work in Image Encoding and Online Publishing. And we'll be hearing from two speakers here today. Um, although it is two speakers in an hour and a half block, we will be keeping the initial presentations to a half hour each to support panel hopping for those who are doing that. But that will give us a little bit of extra time at the end uh, for any further questions or follow-up discussion with either of the presenters. Um, Laura, let's get the session slide up there if that good. works for you. So our first presenter is Laura Mann from Frankly Green and Web USA, presenting on Making a 21st Century Combine, SF MoMA's first online collections catalog. Good morning. Okay, let's let me adjust the microphone here. Okay, can P everybody hear me? Is this on? Yes. Okay, good. Um, thanks, Rob. Um, so, as Rob said, I work for Frankly Green and Web. We are a consultancy that does research, strategy, and design work with museums and help them to make smart decisions about digital. Come on in, please. And earlier this year, we worked with SFMOMA to evaluate the museum's first online scholarly collections catalog, the Rauschenberg Research Project. And my collaborator at SFMOMA, Kier Winesmith, is here with us in spirit, but a new baby is keeping him at home in San Francisco. So this is the obligatory picture of printed museum catalogs that all discussions of digital online catalogs pr to start with. I thought I'd get it out of the way early. Um, but in fact, printed scholarly catalogs are an important part of museums' missions. Um, many, many museums publish them, but they have some pretty significant limitations. They are expensive. They are often out of date uh, soon after they come off the presses. They can be inaccessible. You actually have to go to libraries or order them from libraries. And obviously, they don't support any kind of multimedia features like audio or video. And for reasons of cost, they, they have lim real limitations in terms of their potential size and scope. Um, And as I'm sure some of you here know, the Getty Foundation has been exploring the possibilities of online scholarly publishing. And the Rauschenberg Research Project was created as part of the Getty's OSCE project. So the Rauschenberg Research Project, or the RRP, as I'll call it for the next 28 minutes, uh, launched in July of 2013. And it features more than 90 works by Ra Robert Rauschenberg from SF MoMA's permanent collection. It is the museum's largest research effort ever on a single artist. It has more than 500 images, videos, research materials that were assembled for the project, and the equivalent print publication would have been more than 600 pages. Needless to say, that's far longer than any actual print catalog that the museum has ever created. And the RRP is a pretty landmark project for SF MoMA in scope, in scale, and in its intended audience. That is, it's their first online publication for scholarly audiences. And we wanted to know if it was meeting its objectives. This was a really good opportunity to understand how an online scholarly catalog has actually been received by its intended audiences uh, of curators, art historians, art librarians, graduate students, etc. So these were really the key questions that we came to the research project with. And as I walk you through 
the findings from our research, I'm going to try to connect the dots in terms of what the findings for SF MoMA actually mean for the museum field at large in terms of online scholarly publishing. And for people in the room who are working on online scholarly publications, who are thinking about it, who are wondering if they should or shouldn't or what it might involve, um, hopefully our findings will shed some light on how these publications are actually being received by the field. <clears throat> So first, just a few words about nuts and bolts, like what we actually did. Our research project um, used a mosaic approach, combining some quantitative approaches and qualitative. We did an online survey. We did qualitative interviews with um, various members of the target audiences um, and lots of stakeholders from SF MoMA. We did usability testing, and we took a deep look into the museum's Google Analytics for the Rauschenberg Research Project. If anybody wants to talk more in detail about our methods, I'm happy to do that either during the Q&A or after the session. So let's start with some good news. Um, the, uh, not to spoil the suspense, but um, the RRP is reaching its primary audience. Its target users of curators, art historians, professors, graduate students, art librarians are in fact using the site. Uh, it's being used for a variety of purposes, including research and teaching. It's seen as a trusted and authoritative source for scholarly information. And it's also seen to some degree as a new kind of publication, a new form, rather than simply a digital version of a paper book. And the fact that it is being used is notable given the, um, let's just say that the art historical profession has not run to use digital tools and online tools quickly. They have been really slow adopters in moving online and their use of digital tools in their professional work, just as a very broad generalization. Um, so just a quick bit of uh, information about who's actually using the RRP. Um, in terms of responses to our online survey, 69% of the people who um, responded to our online survey who said they had used the RRP were from our primary audiences. And you can see the breakdown here between graduate students, professors, curators, independent scholars, and librarians. Um, so it's reaching its primary target audience. It's also reaching some other audiences. 10% of the folks who responded to the survey are museum educators. There are some undergrads. And there were also listed in those other audiences people interested in digital media and then kind of a mixed bag of other folks. But clearly, the vast majority of people using the RRP are from the scholarly and academic audiences that we hoped to reach. That's a good thing. The other thing that we noticed was that the um, RRP is ha has a comparably more diverse and broader reach than an equivalent print catalog. So looking at Google Analytics, we can see that more than 700 museum, library, university, network domains from around the world have accessed the catalog. And just in terms of numbers of people, in the first six months following launch, there were about 24,000 unique users of the Rauschenberg Research Project. And just to provide a little bit of context, SF MoMA printed catalog runs are generally between 3,000 and 18,000. Um, and a permanent collection catalog and a big catalog would tilt to the smaller end of those numbers. Um, and so, closer to 3,000 than 18. But the other thing to note is that um, at 600 page, more than 600 pages, it would have been impractical to print anything like the Rauschenberg Research Project um, on paper. So the online uh, environment made this publication possible. It wouldn't really have been feasible as a printed volume. Um, so how are people actually getting to the RRP? Well, um, Google is really the key. Um, not surprisingly, all, or maybe surprisingly, in the sense that if we think about scholarly audiences, part of what comes to mind in terms of their working processes would be specialized databases um, like WorldCat and ProQuest and things like that that academic researchers use, but in fact, the 
the, in fact, the vast majority of people coming to the site are getting there through Google. We can be very sure that it's at least 48%, but given the way Google Analytics reports its information, that those numbers are in all likelihood far higher. Virtually everybody we talked to told us they had gotten to the site through Google. Even people at SFMOMA get to the site through Google. And so it has become, I mean, for I'm sure this is true for many of you in the room too, it's sort of like your, it's not really a search engine, it's an extension of your fingers on your keyboard in terms of finding anything. Um, and people found the site through Google in a variety of different ways. Some of them were just doing general research about Robert Rauschenberg. Others were looking for very specific, detailed pieces of information about uh, an, an episode in his life in 1953, and they got sent to a detail in an essay within the Rauschenberg Research Project. And in fact, some of the people I talked to who used the catalog regularly for research were surprised when they entered detail search terms into Google and they were sent back to the Rauschenberg Research Project. So um, uh, Google is critical. Um, so where else would the users expect to find the Rauschenberg Research Project? In the academic databases I just mentioned, like ProQuest or WorldCat or ArtStore, the Rauschenberg Research Project is in these databases. But it turns out that users didn't actually expect to find it there. They wouldn't have looked. They figured that these databases were for articles, and this wasn't an article, so they wouldn't be looking there. So where do they actually expect to find the RRP? Well at the library with all the other books. Um, it turns out that if people were looking for this catalog, they would think it would be listed in their university library catalog just like all the printed exhibition catalogs would be, which on the one hand is great because it reveals a sort of conceptual view of the catalog that doesn't necessarily make a distinction between whether or not it's online or printed. The problem, however, is that there is no standardized process for adding digital publications to university library catalogs. They're happy to do it. It's not like there's a resistance on the part of the art librarians, but it's a little serendipitous as to whether or not they actually add your catalog. Have they gotten a request from a professor? Did they see an email from Arliss or another professional organization. Um, and so when we started this research, the Rauschenberg Research Project was not listed in either the UC Berkeley or the Stanford University catalogs. And by the time we were done with our research, it had been listed um, due to some very specific outreach to those art librarians who were, again, happy to add it, but hadn't, it hadn't really appeared on their radar prior to then. Um, so what does all of this mean for the people in the room who don't necessarily work for SFMOMA? Um, it's, there are specialized search tools, of course, for the scholarly community, but your users are most likely to find your online scholarly catalog using Google. So make it possible for them to do so. Search engine optimization is really important when it comes to these scholarly publications, it turns out. Um, and in fact, that kind of findability, searching within a publication like that is one of the great advantages of online scholarly publications as opposed to a printed book. Um, and beyond Google, though, if the, um, if the RRP is gonna become part of the overall academic research ecosystem, it needs to be listed in research library catalogs. But for the moment, that process is gonna require a bit of manual outreach to the librarians out there because the digital um, publication production um, hasn't, the, standardized library cataloging process hasn't caught up with digital publication processes yet. And then the last minor detail is get an ISBN number from your publication, which for people in the room who don't know what that is, it's the unique numerical identifier for books. And yes, you can get one for a digital book. So how is the RRP actually being used? Well, it splits between um, people who are looking for images, people who are collecting materials for teaching, people who are doing research, pretty evenly split. And then there's a substantial chunk of people here who are interested in online catalogs, who are actually interested in the form, maybe, rather than the content. This is no doubt an indication of the fact that we were doing our research six months after the project launched, and there was a fair amount of interest in this new form. 
Um, and then the other thing that's worth observing about how people use um, the RRP is that compared to general sfmoma.org visitors, they, not surprisingly, stay longer, visit more pages, return more frequently. Um, and in fact, 15% of the visitors have been to the site between nine and 200 times. This is actually not that surprising for a scholarly catalog where you're gonna have a small number of researchers going back again and again to who are people who are focusing on an academic research project on Rauschenberg or related topics. Um, so the primary audiences rated the content of the RRP really highly between useful and extremely useful for pretty much all the categories. Those that you would expect, like scholarly essays, and those that you wouldn't necessarily expect, like videos. Um, the, and this is extraordinary, actually, given that curators and academic art historians are not an easy audience. They are a highly critical bunch. And so the fact that they rated, they were so positive in their, in their review of the content and identifying it as useful is pretty remarkable, actually. Um, the 98% of the audiences, of the primary audiences, said that they were likely to use the RRP for future research, um, and, they, uh, and they are using it. Um, this uh, high, high praise for the content extended to trust in the publication as a scholarly document and source. 37% of the people who had used the RRP said that they were going to cite it in their future research. And what's really interesting about this is that the um, people said that they would cite the RRP or they had cited the RRP in spite of the fact that, quote, I don't normally cite online sources. So this was, this was um, flying in the face of what their normal habits and perceptions of online content um, are. Um, and I have to say just generally, so why is this? Oh, yes, they thought the content was high quality and they thought it was um, interesting and in-depth and useful, but why did they trust it? Well, what a lot of people said to us was that the signifiers for them of academic authority were the following. The institutions associated with the catalog, so the name of SF MoMA, of the Getty Foundation, and of the Rauschenberg Foundation, the names of the contributors, which not accidentally are listed on the catalog's homepage and on every page uh, uh, that is the about the catalog section. Um, they're well-known Rauschenberg scholars. Um, and finally, the formatting of the content, particularly the scholarly essays, which the, um, the SF MoMA production team bent over backwards to make sure that they were, they followed proper academic citation formats. And that was, that turned out to be a, a huge labor when it came to the PDF production of, of downloadable documents, which I'll say a few, more, a bit more about in a second. But um, the, um, <clears throat> But those were the things that really signified academic authority, um, proper formatting, institutional affiliation, and the identity of the contributors. That's what made the scholars really trust this as a publication, apart from the, the quality of the content itself. Um, and the other thing that people really noted to us was that they saw a deeper level of information and different types of information than, that they, than they were normally used to seeing, either in printed catalogs or in online collections databases, for that matter. What they, were, what they singled out was that they saw on the RRP access to information that was normally internal to the museum. So things like marks and inscriptions, ownership, exhibition history information, photographs of the backs of all of the objects, um, the um, conservation reports and other kinds of technical documents. And this quote really sums it up. The, several people said something similar to me that they felt like the museum had opened up their databases um, to them. And they were, they were incredibly enthusiastic about that. Um, the other thing that people both noticed and used were features that were really designed specifically for the academic audiences. So there's l plenty of video on the RRP, and that's not a surprise, and it's a huge bonus for um, a contemporary artist uh, like Rauschenberg, where we have video of him, and that can play a part in an online catalog. But 
the researchers told us that the transcripts of the videos were as useful, if not more useful, than the videos themselves, and the people who wanted the videos for teaching purposes wanted to be able to download and embed the videos in their own class PowerPoints. They can't do that currently, but they would really like to be able to. Um, the specific citation tools on the site, there's an example of here, uh, of one here, which is an automatic create a citation tool um, from any point in uh, a scholarly essay. You can um, clip the proper citation to your clipboard and drop it into your document. Interestingly, a lot of the researchers that we spoke to said, you know, I write my own cita citations. I, uh, but I really appreciate the fact that the museum went to the trouble of telling me how I'm supposed to cite it, even though I might do something slightly different. It shows me that they care about proper citation that, and that this, this publication is meant for an academic audience. The teachers, the university professors said, oh my god, this is fantastic because I don't want my undergraduates coming back with information from the Rauschenberg Research Project and telling me that, quote, I found it on the SFMOMA website because that's not proper academic citation. So there are tools and there's also indications of what proper citation form actually is. Um, downloadability, virtually everything on the site in terms of the assets are downloadable, the images, the associated documents, the essays, et cetera, et cetera, individually or as big packages. Um, and that really reflected the idea, the working process of academics, which is that nobody reads long scholarly essays online. We might read New York Times articles on our computer screens, but if we're academics, we generally don't read long articles except on paper with a pen in our hands. Um, and so this downloadability and portability of the assets in the catalog was really noticed, valued, and used. People are downloading stuff from the catalog a lot, taking it with them to use um, so they can use it offline and do stuff with it. Um, so the other thing I think that's worth noting is that people saw the RRP as offering a new kind of scholarship. This was surprising to us. We, a lot of the things I've mentioned thus far, we anticipated to some degree. But this, this was really interesting. What we heard from scholars was that the kind of analysis that the RRP contained combined art historical inquiry with the kinds of details that you would only know if you had access to the physical objects plus high quality images. So, and that was a kind of art historical scholarship that many people told us they hadn't really seen before. In other words, you have this split in the art historical world between curators who work in museums, who are the keepers of and experts on the details about the objects, and you have the art historians who spend way too much time in front of their computer screens by their own admission, and who don't, aren't necessarily familiar with the physical details of the objects, and who um, write more conceptual scholarly articles. Um, I'm generalizing. but. Uh, but this publication, people really felt, brought those two worlds together in a new way. And that was very interesting and surprising in a good way. Um, so um, this is, I think, what we saw in, in this portion of our analysis was that online scholarly catalogs offer opportunities for both new forms, academic forms, as well as new kinds of content. So it's not just about what you can do technically using your online scholarly catalog. I mean, I love the citation tools and the videos as much as the next person, but in fact, the, the innovation possibilities for online scholarly catalogs, it turns out, go beyond that. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. So challenges. The scholarly audience clearly saw the benefits of um, online catalogs. They loved the accessibility. They loved the searchability. They loved the portability. They liked the updatability. But there were also some challenges, some of which have to do with the RRP specifically or SFMOMA, and some of which are challenges for digital publications as a whole, and some that point to issues in the larger academic world. Um, boundaries of an online scholarly publication, how do you tell where it starts and where it ends? Um, 
the issue of permanence, will this be around in 5, 10, 20, 25 years? Um, scholars are not writing for next week. They are writing for many years from now, and they want some assurances that stuff's going to be around. Because you know if you put a book on your bookshelf that in 20 years, when you come back and take it off the bookshelf, it's still going to be there. You're going to be able to read the text and look at the images. Any notes you made will still be there. And that's what the scholars are looking for in online publications. Um, and finally, um, what is the value of an online scholarly publication for its target audiences, for curators, and for art historians? And then, what will it take as for SFMOMA to make more of these? How replicable is it? Is it replica replicable? Um, so, boundaries. A number of people said to me something like this, where is the container? What makes this a s separate publication? So why did they say that? They said that in part because um, when SFMOMA developed their catalog, they did so very t in a way that's very tightly integrated with their existing online collections pages. The Rauschenberg Research Project does not look like a book. It doesn't look like a PDF. It doesn't look like a separate document that you could hit print and hold in your hand. It looks remarkably like all of the other online collections pages at the museum, with the exception of that, of course, there's lots more content and features. But people, the academic audience had trouble figuring out where the boundaries were. And that was a problem because they really needed to know where the scholarly content started and ended. This is not because they're being old fashioned about form and they want something that looks like a book. This is because the scholarly content from the RRP has been vetted at a level that makes them trusted and makes them willing to cite it. Um, one of the things that we heard from people was that they were frightened to use the search boxes on the site. There isn't a dedicated search box for the RRP alone. I suspect that if SFMOMA had to do this project over again today, there would be one, and I also suspect that there will be one shortly. But for right now, the search boxes, um, in the upper uh, right-hand corner here, you can see a general search box and then a search collections box. What people said to me was that they refused to use that box because they were frightened of what they'd get. They thought that they would be sent somewhere else in the site and they didn't know where. And that was really concerning because maybe they would end up on pages that weren't exactly part of the RRP and where the content wasn't um, vetted to an academic standard. Um, so those boundaries are really key. Um, the question of permanence, will this be here in 20 years, it's a huge concern for this audience. Um, and they, they really, they felt it's a concern for two reasons. One, for people who might contribute to online scholarly catalogs, and for people who might cite online scholarly catalogs. And those citations in, are kind of the lifeblood for scholarly publications. If you don't get cited, you sort of cease to exist after a certain point. And, um, uh, and so willingness to cite online publications is crucial. One of the people I interviewed said to me, you know, I, I cited, I had some links in my dissertation and when I was going to convert my dissertation to a book, the links were broken and that was really embarrassing. That kind, the, the extent to which those, um, the, the, the citations that translate into broken links, that's professional embarrassment for art historical scholars. Your, your links are supposed to continue to work if, if you've cited them in your publication. Um, and so they want to know that those, that those URLs are still going to be stable 10 years from now. Um, as somebody said to me, the, the, um, the, for institutions that are in the memory business, the potential fragility of online publications is very frightening. Um, so status, the value of an online scholarly catalog for this audience. The answer to this question depends a little bit on who you are. Um, curators, although they acknowledge that they'd rather publish in a printed book, um, were perfectly happy to contribute to uh, an online catalog. Um, but 
um, the academics were considerably less willing to do so, in part because um, they, <clears throat> excuse me, because it doesn't count towards tenure. And that doesn't have to do with it being an online publication. That has to do with it being a museum publication. Online or not, it doesn't count towards tenure. But one of the things that people said to me was, but the RRP, it seems like sort of a different publication. I don't know what a tenure committee would think about that in a few years. And this world does seem to be changing. Um, and then finally, um, the the RRP itself is changing some minds about like what's actually possible, including people at SFMOMA who didn't work on the project and contributors to the RRP itself, who didn't necessarily think much of online scholarly publishing at the beginning of the project, but now are, um, have become converts. So part of the takeaway there is um, this is People are going to, a academics are going to trust these kinds of publications um, simply by us doing good ones. Like getting out there and doing it um, is, is the big takeaway for that, I think. Um, but within that context, like clear boundaries are critical that translates to trust in the source. Um, the, the question of can they be both permanent, um, updatable, and archivable, because academics also wanted to retain the original source, even as you updated the catalog. And the, the perceptions and of the value of these kinds of publications is really tied to um, the tenure system in the academy, and there's not a whole lot that any one museum can do about that. Um, uh, my personal opinion is that um, it would be an interesting conversation for the Getty Foundation to have with a group of research universities about what counts and doesn't count for tenure. Um, but that's, that's not a conversation for a single museum, I don't think. Um, so quickly, is it replicable? Um, I know I'm running over time slightly and I'm just about done. Um, is it replicable? Well, as with any kind of question around this, it's, it's not just about the technology. Um, um, it's really, uh, replicability will require some institutional and organizational changes at SFMOMA, and I suspect at many, many institutions that would want to work on online scholarly publishing projects. Um, the, uh, it will require new roles and responsibilities. Um, different ways of working across the institution, um, some human, some technical. Doing the RRP required various technical systems to talk to each other at SFMOMA that hadn't necessarily talked to each other before because the information that came together in the RRP existed in several different databases. I'm sure none of you have that problem. Um, and. Uh, as well as the roles and responsibilities. Who owns online scholarly public publishing in museums? Um, Who plays the project manager role versus the content expert role? Um, and kind of most critically, I would say, how do museums incorporate workflows for scholarly publications, particularly for the permanent collection, when they are traditionally so driven by special exhibition deadlines. In other words, how do you gain the workspace and the human and financial resources to devote to an enormous project like this that has nothing to do with a special exhibition? And the final piece is, how do you actually quantify that? Because um, a, a catalog is 600 pages or 500 pages, but what's the actual scale of an online scholarly catalog? The, gr the extent to which you can quantify that um, means you can actually represent what the level of work might be to produce it and therefore go from a single online publication to actually a program of scholarly publishing that's adequately resourced. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, for those of you at the back, there are a few seats scattered here and there if you would like to filter in or not. Uh, we'll hold questions until after the next presentation so we can keep running on time here. Uh, but since we do just have the two presentations in a hour and a half block, uh, there'll be some time at the end for questions to either presenter. Next up, we have Roy Burns who is from the Rochester Institute of Technology.
And actually, while the projector searches for the laptop, if anybody has a quick question for Laura, we could squeeze one in here. Evan. When you say transportability, what do you mean? Deplorability to another resource so that that could play nicely with other electronic uh, online catalogs. Say if uh, OCLC decided to create a collection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, uh, in leveraging their existing technical architecture, for the um, RRP, um, SFMOMA made a bunch of sort of strategic choices and compromises. I think what they did was leaned in favor of portability and transferability to their next online iteration, which they're building right now, which I strongly suspect will have will be designed to play well with others. And so that's kind of, it's not a linear path, but they will end up there. Um, and in terms of, uh, um, I'll have to answer your, your second question next, because I don't Right, let, let, let's cut to Roy now, but. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I want to start in the beginning. And in the beginning, there were color CRT displays, most commonly driven by Windows operating systems. And this led to um, the I IEC a standard known as sRGB. And um, it was based on a set of TV phosphors that were popular at the time period. So S stood for standardized RGB. Some people thought it stood for Stokes, uh, who was the, um, the person at, uh, at HP who worked on this. And as we know, we have our usual profile for sRGB. Now, I like to think of this as an output referred profile in that the hub of this system is a CRT display. And so whatever your camera is shooting, it's going to be processed within this gamut of an sRGB display, which then leads you to print it on an RGB printer. And one of the advantages of the system is it required no color processing. So you can plug in your RGB device to RGB device and everything worked nicely theoretically. And at some level, it's, it's certainly shown itself to be a reasonable approach. Now, one of the issues with this is we talk about sRGB as having a small gamut. So here's an image that I took from um, Wikipedia. And what it's showing um, with the magenta line is swap CMYK. So this represents perhaps a typical printer. And we see that sRGB almost covers that. We then get to Adobe RGB, which is bigger, and Profoto, which is getting bigger still. So depending on what it is you're trying to archive, it may or may not be in gamut. And this is pretty well known. So right now we have two recommendations, almost in a sense standards, for how to um, record our digital assets uh, image-wise. The first comes from Europe, and it's called Metamorphose. And what they're recommending is ECI RGB volume or version 2. This is based on a set of NTSC primaries from the 1950s. So this is also a display-based system. D50 white point, L star gamma, and then 8 or 16 bits. In the United States, we have a standard or recommendation, FAGI. And it's recommending Adobe RGB 1998, which has a D65 white point, 2.2 gamma, and 8-bit. Neither group really evaluated paintings in any detail. So that was my question. What happens when I start working on this stuff for paintings? So I did some calculations that is published in a technical report at RIT, so I'll summarize that for us here. 
I used an artist paint database. So this was a set of paints from Golden Acrylics that I used as a representation of, of artist paints. Um, I made drawdowns, I created a physical database. I then used computation, computational um, optical models to extend the database. And then I computationally varnished the samples, which as we know is going to increase contrast. And so I ended up with 1,700 samples made from a lot of typical artist pigments, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, thalo blue, which would also represent um, Prussian, thalo green, pyrrole orange, aerolite yellow, similar to cadmium, pyrrole red, similar to cadmium red, dioxazine purple, quinacridone magenta, and, and white. And one of the things that was very important to me is to include orange pigments, because quite often those tend to get left out when we do these types of analyses. And the, here you can see the gamut that's uh, generated here. This is in uh, C-Lab. So I can start to do calculations and ask the question, how well do these different encoding schemes encompass this set of um, colors? Now, these are 3D, but we're looking down, so that's projection. So we're not seeing the whole picture, but we're getting a, a, a pretty good uh, sense of this. So here we can see sRGB, and it fails pretty badly in the yellow-red uh, area. As we know, Adobe RGB was a lucky typo, where effectively Adobe was trying to write the sRGB chromaticities, and they made an error in writing down the green. And so we suddenly have, you can see it pretty clearly here, that by changing the green primary location, it then extends the gamut, but it still doesn't work for yellows and oranges. Here's ECI RGB. Again, it's a television device, and if you've looked at CRTs, you know that it, they don't make good yellows. Okay, same problem. Once we move into Pro Photo RGB, or what's uh, also being used, Pro Star RGB, obviously we're now into a wide gamut system, which appears to be well encompassing this set of colors. But looking at it in 3D and actually doing the calculation, so this is the percentage of out of gamut colors from these different encoding systems. sRGB, 60%. Adobe RGB, 43%. ECI, 39%. Profoto, 1%. And C-Lab, a half percent. Some camera companies are starting to provide um, profiles for C-Lab. So my conclusn was sRGB, Adobe RGB, ECI RGB should not be used for paintings. Only Profoto, ProStar RGB, and C-Lab should be used. However, if you're going to use these systems, as we know, it's got to be 16-bit. And at 16 bits, the gamma between 1.8 and L-star were largely equivalent. So there's a lot of discussion about, you know, I've got to use L-star gamma encoding. A lot of those discussions have to do with 8-bit encoding. Well, the world of artist materials, modern materials, has changed drastically probably in the last, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 years. We now have fluorescent colors. So this is, uh, I guess, a guitar from Jimi Hendrix, fluorescent paint. We have iridescent colors, interference colors, I think that's shown here um, at the EXP in uh, Seattle. We have metals. And this is a very interesting um, image. So this is from a Dan Flavin um, work where he's using colored fluorescent tubes. Does it look like it's fluorescent tubes, if you didn't know? Does it perhaps look like it's white light and colored walls? So in other words, the color here is getting blown out by the limited dynamic range. So shooting flavor and stuff, really tough. 
We also have materials that are sort of interference pigment materials. And you can only really show them by a video. So these are manufactured now by JS or S JDSU. <coughs> And you get the idea. Now, I brought examples with me. So this is something that Chromaflare gives out. And this is a, an automotive finish, so it's a base coat, clear coat. So it's got a very high gloss lacquer finish on this. So imagine this is your art, and now you have to shoot it. <laughs> right? This, this is reality. Um, this is a, a drawdown that comes from the manufacturer. So this is the paint without the top coat on it. And I'll be showing you how well this imaged with these different encoding schemes. Um, and I don't know if you, how well you can see this, but as we change the angle, you start to get a second color coming in. Right? You, you want to capture this. So. As I started thinking about this, it seemed that we needed a new encoding system. Particularly, I wanted to have a system that went beyond white being 255, you know, talking in 8 bits because it's just simpler. In other words, right now, with our current encoding, when you have, let's say, L star 100, 0, 0, that's the perfect reflecting diffuser. That's not a colored highlight. So I wanted to be able to encode specular highlights. I wanted to be able to minimize quantization artifacts, large gamut. Because we're in a world of D50 for printing, D50 white point, and in a sense, not output, I guess I keep saying preferred, but it's referred. And I wanted it to be an RGB space because there's a lot of applications where you really need an RGB space. LAB just doesn't work for certain types of processing. So this system um, was work done with Max Derhack, who is a, a big mover and shaker in ICC. So this was done with somebody who actually does this type of encoding. So I called it ETRGB for extended tristimulus, bit depth 16 bits or higher, D50 white point, and now I've got to choose primaries. And I thought, okay, what set of primaries is going to encompass everything? And that leads to the apices of the CIE chromaticity diagram. So um, here is the spectrum locus, which are the most saturated colors that one can make of real colors. These are monochromatic lights on the edge. And the CIE system was designed to encompass this. So now we have our primaries at this point, this point, and this point. And because it's D65, you might notice that the XYZs are for, this is for XN, YN, and ZN of uh, D50. The next thing was extending the input range. And the maximum that you can extend for ICC is zero to two luminance factor. So in other words, instead of going to zero to one, which would be the perfect reflecting diffuser, I'm now going all the way to two. And this means I'm now encoding zero to 130 L star. And I'm still using a nonlinear encoding because again, why give up any you know, quantization possibilities if you can be nonlinear, and you can. So I'm using the L-star nonlinear encoding, which has become popular with ProStar. And this kind of is a table which sort of shows you at L-star of 100, for 8-bit, it would be 196. Here's 14-bit, which is some camera encoding. And then this is 16-bit. So I can calculate the number of bit depth, basically, that the 50,000 counts is out of 65,000. And so in a sense, I'm losing half a bit of um, precision. Not a, not a big deal. And here is the profile 
And we're using a parametric definition of the profile, not a lookup table. And so I had to re-derive some of these values in order to fit into now this extended range. And you can see that ICC um, profile software, you know, only is show I guess this is color sync. It's only showing you from zero to 100. So that's why this keeps going up. So we can look at gamuts, top views, um, 3D views. And you know, these are really big ranges from plus to minus 450. So ProStar, LAB, here's the new system. So there's no question that this is a really wide gamut system, and that's by design. <coughs> I also did looking at quantization errors, both with um, uncertainty, looking between floating point, then encoding digitally, then going back to floating point. Um, and this TRGB is looking at the tri-stimulus encoding without the extended range. So this would be a normal um, perfect reflecting diffuser being 255. And for these colors, you can see that on average, you know, these different encoding schemes are not really that different from Profoto. Some differences at maximum error. So there is a small price to pay with having the extended range. And you can see then if I start adding uncertainty, if we look at the 90th percentile, again, we're still below 0.1 delta E2000. This is very small. Okay. This is all nice. I now want to do an imaging experiment, right? It's one thing to write this down. It's another thing to see whether it works. Um, and I have to point out that I had to do all this myself because if you use the camera's encoding, you're already done for, right? It's already been changed. So I have a CNR um, 86H 40 megapixel sensor, um, the repro body, e shutter, HR 100 lens. And, uh, Actually, in this case, I only used a single bronze color pulse hole strobe. Calibration, keep it simple, x right color checker classic. And then I imaged this thing, and I curved it so that it, the, uh, the color change would be in the image. I also did something where I set the exposure to half its full range. If we think about imaging metals and things where we have colored highlights, we often underexpose to have a little more headroom. So I thought, I'm gonna do this as well. And so my camera gives 14 bits, so in this case I set the, uh, the color checker white to those levels. I then convert to floating point. I then scaled so that the white is 0.9. And then I derived a matrix transform to XYZ, and then I encoded in Profoto or ETRGB. So I'm doing all this in, in MATLAB. So this is the image that I, that I took. So here's my color checker. Again, I'm fooling around here. I'm trying. I've got some metals in here. Um, I've, I had received a... a and a, a Lifetime Achievement Award, and I thought I'd finally get some use out of the thing, so. <laughs> I guess that's kind of irreverent, but you know. Um, and then I'm trying some different, different Christ, you know, Christmas ornaments, either shiny or, or you know, more diffuse. So, here's the result. The pro photo image is, doesn't have the dynamic range to capture the full amount of color that's in the actual sample. So if we compare the amount of purple that's here compared to here, it's a significant difference. So again, it's not that pro photo doesn't get some of it, it doesn't get as much of it. So I was pretty excited because I thought, okay, Here's this new encoding system, and it seems that it could be really useful for, you know, modern materials. Again, if you're shooting um, drawings, right, sRGB is fine, or books, but we're now we're talking about modern art. So I guess the next steps is to do more testing, 
But the problem is, in order for any of you to test it, you have to have a camera manufacturer being willing to give you this encoding as, a, as an option, right? Because if you're starting off with whatever, whatever um, encoding you like, you're already in a reduced gamut, so you've lost that advantage, so. And of course, I'm sure there's lots of camera manufacturers here today, so. Um. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, you know, it's just, I don't know whether it's gonna really be something worthwhile or not. Based on my limited experiments, it seems kind of exciting. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. And we do have some time. Uh, I'd suggest we start with any questions for Roy while this is all fresh. And then if we do have any questions for Laura, we can loop back to that. Yeah, Robert. Um, my first question is, with uh, the current gamut of monitors, how were you able to see the difference between the Prophoto and the ETRGB? Like, how did I do that? How could I do this, right? Exactly. So in this case, I'm, I'm really depending on Photoshop's ability, how it does gamut mapping, okay. right? So, yeah, because obviously this is beyond the display gamut. So what I'm, you know, and these are, these are encoded images that I'm now, you know, throwing into this talk. And so we're really depending on, in a sense, you know, I, I had to, I had to turn these into sRGB in order to put this in the talk, right? So, you know, I, my experience is that Photoshop does quite a good job with, with gamut mapping, not messing up hue, right? So I thought this would be able to show it, but it's, you know, it's a good point, right? I need, I need the printer that'll do this, right? Any other questions for Roy? Yes. Yeah, and, and this could certainly be very helpful. Yeah, that's a good point. Roy, did you do any testing with polarization? Not, not really, but maybe you can tell me how you would use it. You know, I'm always learning here. So, I mean, what would the, so you're talking about doing cross polarization? Well, I guess if you do the cross-polarization now, I'm, I'm going to get rid of um, any specular highlights, right? And, and, and what I don't really know, because it would be interesting to do it on these samples, is whether that will kill off the color specular or just the white. I suspect it will kill off the colored as well, so that could be a problem. Yeah. Yeah, I get how this question was I think, and your answer I think was good. So, but I guess what is happening is that you're actually capturing more information than you're actually able to see in any representation. No, no, no. It, it's not going beyond what you can see. Not with us, but be represented. So, it, what's it, being captured in the image is not being reflected in the display. That's correct. So, so I'm moving. I'm saying that the display is irrelevant from an archival perspective. I don't care if I can't see it, but the information is there, and if I want to use that information for any type of science or conservation, or in the future when we have printers that maybe can match this, I mean, the information is there for me. I'm not losing it. How are you verifying the accuracy of the information without being able to see it? So in that case, I have to shoot targets and then analyze their, their color, you know, with the spectrum. So I can compare spectrophotometric measurements with the image data, right? So I can take the image data and I can, you know, calculate LABs and delta E's and all that stuff. And, and, in, and for these type of materials, the experiment might ultimately have to be aiming a spectroradiometer right at the sample. So, yeah. Do you have another question? Oh. Did you try 
mean, no. I mean, my, my expectation would it, 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 it would show the same problem. Um, so it's, it's kind of moot for us who don't, I mean, in everyday reproduction, unless we get. Right. At this point in time, it would, for, for you to use it, we would have to get a camera manufacturer to put it in as an encoding option. And, and maybe they would if you asked. I mean, Basic Color started encoding in LAB because people, you know, I, well, I was bitching about it. So, so there's hope. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have another question, Robert? Oh, oh, yeah. Um, Kurt? Now, tangentially, I mean, potentially, usually BRDF is not color information, but more of a light reflectance. It's more about how the specular shape is varying. So it's kind of an interesting question as to, well, I, that's not entirely, I, let, me, let, me re, let me restate that. Certainly BRDFs are produced that represent different materials such as metals, plastics, and so forth. And so, you know, it might be possible to use the actual BRDF shape of these type of materials with that encoding. I mean, certainly ICC Max is going to have a lot of these capabilities. Yeah. Just on that, I don't know how the system, I work in 3D we have So we, that's an area of current research for us. I could, I guess I could show a little video of what we're doing. So we have a, a technique now that we're shooting from, with four different lights and we stopped doing polarization. So we used to use cross polarization to kill off, you know, specular. <coughs> and what we're doing now is we're assuming that if I have four different light directions, chances are at any given pixel, the specular is only going to come in one, from one of those lights. So then I can throw out that light. So we have kind of a hierarchical technique. So then I can generate surface normal and, and do rendering. I mean, I don't know if we have time, but I'm happy to show a quick video what, what we're doing that. So I can show you later. Yeah, let, let's, let's hold that for the yeah. very end of the time. Um, I mean, the hyperspectral is sort of taking one step back, right? So now you've got spectral data. And so by the same token that you say, well, I can't necessarily see this, I can't see that either. And so generally, this, the hyperspectral camera, once you want to have a color image, you have to now take all the spectral data and do a calculation for some encoding space. So that would fit well into this. And the hyperspectral has the potential to give you more accurate colorimetry. And so, you know, you could keep both the spectral information and um, an encoding. So we have a system where we're doing a five channel multispectral. And so I keep those, or a six channel, I keep the six channels and I often also add on an RGB image that's color managed. So in one image file, I've got everything. Great. Let, let's take a transitional moment here um, yep. and let's hold that video idea because it would be great if there's a moment to show it uh, okay. in a few minutes. But were there any questions for Laura about SF MoMA's Rauschenberg catalog resume?
Excuse me, sure. Um, yes, the Rauschenberg Foundation was really, really closely involved with the development of this project. It would not have been possible without them, there's no question. Um, and, uh, and so I think that um, other projects, um, particularly those involving modern and contemporary art, obviously bring with them really significant rights questions. And um, both, I think, in terms of resources, like what's actually required to try to do rights clearance, if you don't have the kind of point-to-point -point close working relationship that SFMOMA had with the Rauschenberg Foundation, if you're not doing a monographic project, uh, but rather working across multiple artists, multiple artist foundations, that's a significant undertaking, as you guys well know. Um, I think the other issue that rights that, that's brought up for me in terms of rights has to do with the permanence question. And that is that our rights system is organized around um, uh, specific time spans and print runs and all of that sort of stuff that, that doesn't fit with the online environment. And so part of the, the challenge of permanence for these kinds of publications has to do with rights because you can, you can do all of the technical things right and ensure that you have a, a permanent URL and you have redirects and you have, um, you're really supporting the longevity of your online publication, but if after five years you can neither financially support paying for additional rights or you, your, your relationship with the rights holder um, disintegrates, then your publication is either going to be eviscerated or it's going to come down. And so I think that, that this is, um, it is a huge challenge. So the, uh, the way that SFMOMA is thinking about it is they are planning on doing annual updates and um, collecting information, additional objects, et cetera, et cetera, and, and then um, marking those so that it's clear when the additions are happening and what kinds of additions they were. And so that that question of, of kind of uh, the original object, as it were, um, and retaining the content from the original catalog, but also having updatability is, is important to them. And then from, a, I think from a workflow perspective, it makes the most sense for them to do it annually. And I think that right now, with one online scholarly publication, annual updates is perfectly manageable. Um, if you think about transitioning to a program of scholarly publishing or multiple kinds of online publishing, the question of how you manage updating becomes much more significant and the, the issue of sustainability really comes up, I think. I think the question of whether or not there's a distinction depends on who you ask and what their, what kind of, where, from where they stand, right? Because if you, I, I can tell you with some certainty based on the conversations I had with, the art, with art historians and curators that they would never ever cite um, C-I-T-E, a microsite, S-I-T-E, in their academic work full stop. So the question of who your project is designed for and what job it's meant to do, in part you have to speak the language of your target audience and work within some existing understood taxonomies even if you're, tr you're also trying to innovate new forms and do something that is really different. So Yes. 
Yes. I also think, though, that it's, it's most certainly not a microsite because, because there aren't really any borders. It doesn't exist except for some tabs. It doesn't have a separate existence, separate from the rest of SFMOMA's online collections. What I, the question I think you could ask is, is this a publication or is this your online collection on steroids? Right? I mean, and, and that's, a, that's also a question, but I think the, the, the best answer to that goes back to what, before, what I said before about audience. I, you're absolutely right. I think that um, a, I, there is documentation at SFMOMA of what the, of the architecture of it. I think that, just to say something about the architecture, I think that they, by leveraging their existing technical architecture, which was, had lots of benefits, they also um, chose to make some compromises. And so the structure of the RRP reflect some of the limitations of their online collections in that their assets are very tied to individual artworks and it's, it, it hangs together really well because it's monographic and because you don't have the variable of multiple artists. And so the, the, that incredibly, um, that overarching lens of the individual artworks is it's, it's very digestible because it's a monograph. But once you start getting into multiple artist publications, you, you really have to rethink how you're gonna present that information. So you're it's, I think they're wrestling with that right now. There's a nice visualization of something like that that MoMA did last year, and unfortunately I can't remember the title of it, but somebody in the room might remember, um, that visualizes artistic relationships. I thought they did a nice job. I don't work at SFMOMA, and so I actually can't speak to the question of copies um, and and kind of um, disaster recovery, security, preservation, all of those kinds of questions, right? Um, uh, what I would say, though, is that this issue of permanence that came up in the research really pushed SFMOMA to think hard about what their strategy was around the long-term sustainability of something like this. And I think they're, I mean, they were already thinking about it, but I think it, it, it added a lot of fuel to that fire. And so I think they're thinking about um, what they might be doing around keeping this available to the public. I think the question of what their strategy is internally, um, I think is wrapped up in the redesign of their website and their online collections because I think their first job is to design that technical architecture and port everything over because that's something they're working on right now. There's, and there's always the Wayback Machine. Yes, there's, there is the Wayback Machine, which is a wonderful thing and I'm very grateful for it, but I wouldn't want that to be our only option. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions for either of our presenters? 
Great. Well, then, thanks again to both of them.